Welcome to Mikey Guy's Longevity Education Hour. Okay, maybe just a bit over an hour. This session is recorded from Clubhouse. Sound might be spotty at times, but we want you to hear an unabridged live audience and the questions others have. If you have an expert of subject you want to learn more about, please email us at hello at mikeyguy.com. Mikeyguy stands for My Ikigai, a Japanese concept encompassing sense of purpose. And our purpose is to make longevity a lifestyle you want to practice. Learn more about it and try your curation of the best evidence-based product science has to offer at Mikey Guy. Enjoy the session. I have to stay up very late since it's in Oxford. <laughs> We're affecting oh, no. the longevity today. <laughs> hey, it's, 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 oh, no, 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 Jennifer, it's a, it's a absolute pleasure to meet you. Um, I think it was a NPR show. I sent it out to my interns and I also sent it out to Laura where you were interviewed. And, you know, I like, I have a, I have a PhD in cell biology and the, the, I mean, how little throughout education that we learned about ovaries beyond like the basic information. I mean, I literally, after listening to that show in the car, um, when I was driving the, in a podcast form, because we don't get NPR live here, obviously. Um, but, uh, I just I just called a meeting and I and I literally asked point by point to uh, my research students. Some of them had just recently graduated um, in biomedical science, and some of them from biochemistry here at Oxford. And I was like, "Do you know this about the ovary? Do you know this about the ovary? All the points that you had hit." And it was just just absolutely shameful that none of the things are still taught, none of the things are still questioned and looked at it in a way. And I don't want to give obviously anything away, but you saw the questions and the list of things, and most of them were put together by. Uh, my research students and yeah it is just it was just absolutely fascinating to hear about your project so I would 100% stay up uh, anytime to talk to you guys. <laughs> thank you thank you yeah I mean it's really when you start to dig, dig into it it's it's, uh, it's horrifying and shocking how little we know. <laughs> yeah it's it's totally surprising sorry no I always keep saying that that I mean women have been having their um the men menopause since the beginning of time. And it seems to me we're only looking into it now, which it is very shocking. And that's why I'm very excited to have you here today to this, speak about this. Yeah, I think it's been a taboo, to be honest. It's one of those things that's um, associated with female health. It's just one of those things that has been, for some, some reason, taboo to talk about, much less study. <laughs> So we are, it's at top of the hour. We're going to start right at 6 p.m. And um, I've pinged some people. Please feel free to uh, ping other people into the room. We are going to be recording this session. So if uh, we're, we're going to first start with a 30 to 45 minute Q&A with Jennifer. And then people can come up to ask questions. Um, this session is part of a uh, women's longevity fall session that I'm running with Mikey Guy and uh, Avik has kindly decided to co-host these with me, which I really appreciate. I'm going to get to my notes and then start reading from them to make everything easier for me. Um, today we have Professor Jennifer Garrison, who, ran, who runs the Garrison Lab at the Back Institute of Research and Aging, which is focused on understanding how the brain controls ovarian aging. Jennifer is also the founder and director of the Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality, an organization devoted to supporting breakthrough research on reproductive aging and women in science. Um, Jennifer, I'll let you say hello to your audience, and then we'll pass the mic to Avi to say hello as well. Thank you. Hi, Laura. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here to talk about this, and uh, I can't wait to hear all of the questions. Um, hopefully, this will be a lively discussion. Um, over to you, Avi. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to this discussion uh, more than anyone else, I think. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm a biomedical scientist and entrepreneur based in Oxford. Um, I have previous biotech companies and two stealth tech startups um, that are happening. I work in the health and longevity space as an advisor and a investor in North America, Europe, China, and India. And I advise governments regarding this infrastructure for helping out, you know, the longevity biotech industry. Over to you, Laura. 
Thanks, Avi. And um, I have to say that Avi is the all things longevity, including the godfather to my dog, Mobile, who we're going to make sure he lives a long time. <laughs> um, Jennifer, the first question has to do with a recent appearance that you had at the Soul Conference in New York, which is a really big and important investor conference. You said that figure out ovarian aging, with, if we could figure out ovarian aging, we could figure out longevity. Could you elaborate on this? Yeah, absolutely. And I will say that the, the title of our panel at the SALT conference was um, something about living 200 years, which obviously was designed to grab attention, um, but it's fundamentally the wrong question, right? We're not trying to make people live to be 200. We're trying to extend the number of years that someone is healthy, so extending their health span. And what I meant by that was that, um, you know, the pathways that we know about so far that, that seem to be operating in the ovaries in terms of aging are the same pathways that are important for aging in the rest of the body. So things like mitochondrial dysfunction, um, changes in inflammatory states, senescence, defect in DNA damage repair. These are all things that we know are contributing to ovarian aging. And so the idea is that if we can figure out why ovaries are aging prematurely, that will give us a clue about what's happening in terms of aging in the rest of the body. So we basically want to we want to use what we learn about ovarian aging to provide novel insights into systemic aging. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, I think it was Savi who mentioned that it was, it was also a great model because with that, you, you even said in the, in the panel that you could then look at um, everyone's own job. Exactly. Well, there's you know, there's another piece to this, which is right now there's a huge push, right? I mean, we've made so much progress in the last five to 10 years in terms of extending healthy longevity, right? There's just been an explosion in terms of our understanding of basic mechanisms of aging. And, you know, the reason that we're doing that, obviously, is because aging is a, basically a, a public health pandemic, right? It is the major risk factor for most chronic diseases in the developed world. Um, and since there's going to be more people over 65 soon than there are people under five <laughs> for the first time in our history, um, this is a real, a really important issue. And one of the things that has arisen as, um, you know, something we need to navigate is that soon I, I hope that the FDA will recognize aging as either a disease or an indication that can be treated like a disease. And so how are we going to be testing aging interventions, right? In the lab, we test aging interventions in model organisms, things like um, worms and flies and mice and rats and sometimes monkeys. And occasionally, um, you know, now we've got some spectacular uh, efforts around looking at aging in dogs. But longevity in humans has been, you know, basically just something that was unachievable testing out longevity interventions in humans. But if you think about the ovaries, right, as a model for, for aging, Ovaries are aging at about two and a half times the rate of the rest of the tissue in a, in a female's body. And so what that means in practice is that when a woman is in her late 20s, early 30s, her ovaries are um, they're showing overt signs of aging, while the rest of you know, her tissue is essentially functioning at peak performance. And so if you think about testing uh, aging interventions uh, on ovaries, <laughs> Right? So looking at reproductive longevity in a woman, as opposed to looking at, uh, you know, entire lifespan, which is, you know, 50, 70, 90 year trials, totally not doable. But you could look at an endpoint, which is improvement in ovarian function, which could last somewhere between, you know, two to five years, maybe seven at the outset. And suddenly you have, you have something that's very tractable in terms of clinical studies. And that is, you know, that's really powerful when it comes to thinking about aging interventions. Um, go ahead, Avi. Well, no, no. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, Jennifer, you answered a whole bunch of questions, uh, that, that I, that I had on this topic, which is that, so, I mean, kind of to summarize for myself and the audience, um, so far, and, and, you know, this, this show is being recorded. So we want to put this in the transcript as well. Um, not only do, so, so we know that, you know, you know, the 74 organs that we have, they age at different rates. Uh, and of course, they age at different rates in different people. But you were saying that the ovaries in a woman are the fastest aging organ, and they age rather rapidly. So by the time a woman is in her 30s, um, it, 
ovarian age may be uh, more like 60 or 70 compared to other organs, as in biological age. So it's almost um, old or geriatric organ by that time in, in the 30s, if I understood you correctly. Is that is that what you are saying? And and then followed from that, you are, if I understand again, you uh, understand you correctly, you're pointing out that ovaries could actually be a great biomarker of aging, both for understanding the aging process, but also for using it as a biomarker for testing interventions. Is is all of that um, accurate? I yeah, that's absolutely accurate. And um, I hesitate to use the word geriatric. I know I have used it in the past, but I. I uh, I realize that a lot of women who listen uh, to these to these interviews they get really just depressed when they think about um, their ovaries being geriatric. But you know it's it's true that in the female body um, that the ovaries are the very first to show signs of aging. And if you think about you know what does ovarian aging mean? You know what are we talking about exactly? Um, you know menopause is essentially defined by a woman running out of eggs or follicles, and that leads to a host of different things that, um, that we are all familiar with, but one of those is, of course, um, not having a, a period, no longer menstruating. There are other you know, dramatic health consequences to that. But ovarian aging, essentially, if you we're talking about the number and the quality of eggs that are contained in an ovary, you could almost make the, the argument that the aging process starts before birth. <laughs> Because a, a woman has a, a female fetus has all of the eggs um, that it will ever have uh, before birth, somewhere around six or seven million. And by the time a female uh, baby is born, that number has dropped already to one million. <laughs> so, uh, and then by the time uh, puberty hits, which is still, I would say, before you even really want to use your ovaries, that number has declined to just a few hundred thousand. And then once menstruation starts, um, essentially you're losing a, about a thousand eggs per month. And so there's a there's a decline in the number of eggs, but there's also a decline in the quality of eggs. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about ovarian aging. So, yeah, definitely the first organ to age in the body, if if we're if we're going to talk about it that way. So I have a question in terms of. Um... You, it was something that we started with Ray, when we started the call. Why do you think that it's been so understudied or underfunded? Because you think it's a taboo, we just don't want to talk about it as a society, or scientists, on, they, they're not interested in the field? And I know that it's getting a lot of funding and a lot of attention now, which is amazing. But when you think that it's such a recent um, thing, why do you think that has happened? Yeah, this is a really important question and, and something that when I talk about like the biology of ovaries and, and how they relate to aging and the rest of the body, most people are like, well, how is it that we don't know the answers to these kind of basic fundamental questions? And a few years ago, when we started the center and the consortium at the Buck Institute, um, we had these exact same questions. And I'd say there's two reasons. I don't think that there's been a lack of interest. Um, certainly, it's so, I mean, it's so interesting from a biological perspective. Um, and also from a practical perspective, but, you know, number one, there's been a lack of funding, right? And I would say research on women's health in general has been woefully underfunded. When you look at the actual numbers, it's a tiny number relative to the issues that women face. And, um, you know, historically, I think women's health has been kind of relegated uh, to like a niche, uh, sort of a niche area of medicine, right? Rather than looking at a woman um, holistically as you know, half the population is, um, we focus on diseases of the reproductive tract or, um, you know, things that are very specific to uh, female, uh, female organs. Um, but really, you know, in general, women's health has been underfunded. And um, part of that has, you know, it's really dramatically affected what we know. So if the physiology of like the female sex has really been almost purposely excluded from from studies for a, for a long time and that's because you know <laughs> female biology was considered noisy the cycles and the things that happen in a woman's body on a monthly basis um you know it's complicated it's certainly uh maybe considered like a confounding variable when you're talking about biomedical science and so it wasn't until i think 2016 that uh, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, which is the largest biomedical funding resource uh, in America, 
required its grant recipients to include both sexes in animal studies, right? So what that means is that we have preclinical research going back, you know, through the entire century that was conducted primarily in male animals. Um, so, you know, and just in general, we're lacking a lot of information about the female sex. Um, and I think this has blinded us to a lot of um, vulnerabilities that affect females um, and kind of left a gaping hole in our knowledge. So that's number one, just research in this area has been really woefully underfunded. Um, and then the other thing that, that you know, the, the data that we're missing um, from, from not having females included in, in studies like this, those are the, the two main reasons. And, and so this is why we started the consortium um, and the center. So we started a center at the Buck Institute to fund researchers to work on this problem, to try to understand, not, not um, superficially, but truly what are the fundamental drivers of ovarian aging? What are the, the cues or the timers or the, the constellation of cues and timers that will so reproducibly uh, tell a woman's ovaries to start aging you know, um, long before the rest of her body uh, is displaying signs of aging? Um, I could probably talk about this for the whole hour. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm, I mean, I would let you talk about the, this the whole hour, but then we have to get to the questions part and also learn a bit more. I, I'm shocked to hear that it, it was in 2016. That seems like not so long ago that, uh, I mean, we were looking at female mo uh, models, but I was in a room today in which I talked about this call today and um the room is mostly it was mostly women over 50. when i mentioned the idea of delaying menopause or even doing away with it i mean that's even like a moonshot or i it was kind of, there's kind of a pushback on that because some women they do go through menopause is actually a great period for them and they don't want to have their periods anymore but in terms of communication which I, it's one of my favorite subjects in terms of communicating longevity or the benefits of all this technology. What do you think is the best way to communicate the benefit of um, delaying ovarian aging or putting off menopause or figuring out to extend our fertility? Because to me, the most important part is the equity part. Um, women have to make decisions when they are young in terms of the roadmap of their lives because the window in which they are biologically um, at the in the best place to have children is very short and it's when they're very young. So are you guys closely looking at the communication of this in terms of getting more people involved and interested in the field or even more women subscribe to the idea of supporting this kind of research? And uh, we're going to let people ask their questions at the half hour. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, communication is just one of the most important things here. And I have to say, um, you know, the so I, the name of this uh, this thing that I've I've been directing is the Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality, which is a mouthful, right? We call it the GCRLE, but it's you know every single one of those words is important. Um, the global part is important because we realized when we started the center at the Buck Institute to study this problem, we realized right away that we were not going to be able to make a, a true impact if we didn't engage a larger community. And so while there, there definitely were people working on this problem, they were scattered around, there wasn't really a community, and there just weren't enough people, enough scientists devoting attention to this, right? Um, so the consortium has many arms to it. One is to give away grant funding. So we've um, we've given away 20, uh, 22 grants, $7.4 million to researchers all over the world to work on different aspects of this problem because truly there's some just basic science that we need to do before we can change anything. Um, but another piece of the consortium is building out this network to build an ecosystem of, of stakeholders who have an interest in this space. And that might mean creative scientists, but it also means entrepreneurs um, engaging the public and getting them to support the science and the scientists. I think that could really help the field. Um, and, you know, defining room for innovation, forcing people to have conversations who wouldn't normally talk to each other. So I spend a huge amount of my time talking to early stage biotech founders, investors, uh, clinicians, getting clinicians to talk to scientists is a huge goal of ours because there's so much that, that 
clinicians see that scientists don't know about and vice versa. And you know, the, the main goal of what we're doing truly is to facilitate, but also to accelerate getting those basic science discoveries that, that people are making at the bench in the lab and, and moving them into the clinic, into useful products or therapies, moving them into women's hands faster. Um, so yes, uh, communication is a huge part of what we're doing and that's you know part of why I'm here talking to you. But if I can circle back to um, the message and particularly talking to uh, older women who've already gone through menopause. So, I mean, this is a problem that should be on everyone's radar, young women, middle-aged women, older women, but also men. And for women who've already gone through menopause, I, I always like to make the point that, um, that you know, menstruation, uh, having a period is potentially separable from what we're talking about. Um, it may, you know, we're, I would say the, the jury's still out on whether we can separate those two things, whether we can extend reproductive span or the age at which women go through menopause um, and, and make that separate from uh, the act of menstruation every month. But I, I don't think that's necessarily an imperative. Um, but maybe more important than that is the word equality in what we were talking about um, and in the, the name of the consortium. The, the word equality comes in because menopause actually makes a woman's body age faster. So there are studies showing that, you know, if you take young ovarian tissue and transplant it into an old, it can, uh, it can extend health span by about 11%. Um, there are studies showing that at a cellular level, menopause can speed up aging um, by somewhere between 6 and 10%. And so, you know, as we're making progress in extending healthy longevity, if we don't actually address reproductive span, our female reproductive aging, then we're, we're essentially making gender inequality worse, not better, because women are soon going to be living more of their lives after menopause than before. And that matters because, you know, setting aside reproduction and fertility, the, the end of reproductive span uh, essentially sets off this incredibly... Uh, <laughs> dramatic cascade of negative health effects in a woman's body, right? Even in healthy women, there's uh, an increased risk of cognitive decline in osteoporosis, insomnia, depression, heart disease, stroke, osteoporosis, weight gain, arthritis, I could just go on and on. And those are, you know, those are dramatic health risks. Um, there are also the sort of what are qualified as less dramatic, but important uh, quality of life issues that happen in terms of uh, things like brain fog and um, night sweats uh, and, and just, you know, the, the vasomotor symptoms that are associated with menopause, which can really change a woman's quality of life. So I would say that menopause is not a, it's not a, it's not a zero sum game. There are, there are some really dramatic things that happen to a woman's body that we would like to, we, <laughs> we would essentially like to, to stop that from happening. And of course, we want to democratize reproductive rights. You know, the fact that a woman goes through this reproductive decline in midlife is, is truly, it's something that affects decision making at every step of, of her adult life, whether she wants to have biological children or not. Um, this is something that, you know, that factors into decision making about careers, about family planning, um, about overall health. And it's something that men simply don't have to contend with. So that's where the word equality comes in. Uh, it's a word that I brought up and I find um, it's very important um, because women, as I, we have to choose a particular path very early on. And if you don't choose that path of having kids during those years, then there's not much you can do. So I made a joke about being able to have children at 50. And most of the women were like, why would you want to have kids at 50? And I said, well, if we're going to live 100 year lives, why should this not be a possibility? And I think it's most important for future generations, not so much for people that are in their 40s, 50s right now, but teenage, uh, young women, uh, teenagers, 20 year olds, they have to, I mean, potentially this technology could change their lives in ways that we never experience. So I'm very excited about that part, but I'm gonna let Avi ask his next question. Avi? Yep, sorry, sorry, took time to unmute. Um... Yeah, um, I have so many questions. Uh, and as Laura mentioned, we will open up in about nine minutes or 10 minutes uh, to the audience for questions. I know that there are several questions coming. Um, uh, I, I just want to circle back to uh, more basic biology. 
I mean, this may be obvious to many people in this, but I would like to know, Jennifer, why ovaries and, and the ovarian system is kind of unique. So I'm going to bundle in a couple of questions in this, as in, one, why do we have menopause at all? I mean, it seems like it's almost a phase shift. Muscle cells don't do that. Um, fibroblasts or keratinocytes in the skin, or, or I mean, skin systems don't, like they don't just go through an entire phase shift after a certain stage. They don't, like, I, I hope you kind of know what I'm asking. Um, how, how is that there's a state change that happens um, that is really clear and delineated that there is a state before that, and then there's a state after that. Um, and also, um, you mentioned in your previous talks, I learned this from you, is that like only uh, very few animals have menopause. I think you mentioned that there are five uh, at last counts that we know that uh, that have menopause. So in those other animals that don't have menopause, do we, do, do we not see a stochastic decline in health? Um, and why do they not have menopause? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I know these are a lot of questions, but yeah, I mean, why menopause and why only in the ovaries, why don't we see a kind of this phase change in other organs um, and um, uh, other systems? Um, uh, why does it only happen in a few organisms? And in the organisms that it doesn't happen, do we not see a decline in health uh, or, or do we not see a dramatic decline in health, uh, you know, weight matched uh, groups? Yeah, that is. I mean, that's a, that's one of the money questions, but if we could answer that, we would we would be a long way towards understanding the sort of more basic things that we need to know about ovaries in order to intervene. Um, but yeah, why do why do human females undergo menopause at all? This is a very important question. Another question that's related to that is why do we make all our eggs up front, right? Like why do we make them all at the beginning and then sort of dole them out over time? Um, lots of other animals have strategies, you know, where uh, they make eggs continuously. Um, so yeah, I so the the basic answer is we don't know, but there's a lot of thinking around this question. And I actually just hosted a whole one hour webinar last week, um, speaking with an evolutionary biologist about <laughs> why human females are so weird. So there, there are only a few other species that go through menopause, four species of whale. Um, and, and then, you know, uh, there's a, one species of non-human primate that undergoes one aspect of menopause-like features, but not another. So it's, it's not quite a, a full menopause. And so this state change, this going from completely functioning to completely not functioning is very odd. Um, and we really don't know why. There's a lot of ideas on why menopause evolves. Um, the grandmother hypothesis is one, um, the reproductive conflict hypothesis. But the bottom line is that it probably evolved for a very good reason, but at the time that it evolved, lives were different, right? So I think it's important to realize that it's not a biological imperative because most animals don't do it. So it's not like if we if we delay um, the the onset of menopause or extend female reproductive span, um, it's not likely that we're going to do something that's detrimental. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I have to say we don't know the answer. <laughs> if we if we could answer that question, we would know a lot more about about what's causing menopause. Um, but those fundamental drivers, you know, of ovarian aging, that's, that's what we're trying to figure out. I wish I had a more satisfying answer for you. No, I, I guess that's why we need the, we need the research. Um, absolutely. Uh, Laura, please feel free to jump in anytime. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep asking like more basic biology and, and mm -hmm. juicy questions that, that I would, I mean, uh, Jennifer, going back to the uh, question that I asked at the beginning, and I know that many people here uh, Nathan is here, Nikhil is here, um, Aaron is here, and um, Nicolina is here, and um, uh, Catherine is here. I, I think many people will be interested in that, which is that, do you think that really in, in, in the near future, we can use um, well, <laughs> ovaries, uh, but of course, the people containing the ovaries as a model system for, for uh, you know, testing biomarkers as a biomarker of aging and, and you know, testing interventions, obviously, that includes the whole human. Maybe we could use ovarian tissue as as a you know um, uh, ex vivo test for for um, a, a, you know longevity interventions. 
uh, that could be a fantastic way to like accelerate this stuff. But also just going back to the thing, Jennifer, do we not know so much about menopause and menopause, what, why it happens, how it happens, because model organisms are difficult? Uh, in, in, I mean, you can't keep whales in lab, so that leaves that one species of primate. So I mean, and and I think do I think elephants go through menopause as well? I I, I don't know. Yeah, you're the expert. But, elephants I mean, do not is go it through because... menopause. <laughs> they don't. Sorry. No. I I guess I yeah yeah um uh, so so I I guess they're not really good model systems that we can actually use in labs to to do that. Is that one of the reasons why the studies in this have been difficult? And what are you going to? How are you going to fix that problem? Yes. Um, for sure, there are no good there are no good animal models of menopause. So, um, you know, there are some imperfect models that exist, um, but but in general, we don't have a really good model of menopause. So, there's a few things to say. One is that um, you know we just we're funding grants in this space for scientists to work on these problems, and and one of the grants we funded was to, for someone um, to basically to, had come up with some really beautiful ideas for uh, adapting rodent models to be more uh, representative of what's happening in humans. And so um, that's the work of Bernice Benayoun and her postdoc um, at USC. And, you know, this is an area of active research. So the ovaries are, you know, um, as an organ system, they're pretty complex, right? So the ovaries have um, really complicated structural um, uh, compartments and, you know, unlike pretty much any other organ in the body, they undergo this dynamic remodeling, um, both during development, but then through each menstrual cycle, there's this very dramatic physical structural remodeling that happens. Um, and, and that, you know, that may or may not be related to uh, menopause, but it's something that, you know, if we're going to study if we want to develop a really good model, we need to be able to model that that sort of structural change as well. And so, understanding how aging affects all of the all of the ovarian compartments, I would say, is very it's complex. Um, so we do need better models, things like um, organoids, um, cellular models that you know that comprise multiple different cell types from the ovary, and and of course you have both the germ cell or the cell that you know the the egg uh, will become the egg. Um, and but then also the somatic tissue that surrounds it, and and those two compartments are constantly talking to each other, and to other reproductive organs, and to the brain. <laughs> and so you know, thinking about how to how to model that in a dish is maybe a little bit more uh, complicated than just putting a couple of cell types together. But um, there's a lot of work going into this area, and I have a lot of hope that that we'll soon have much better um, models to test things in. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's it's coming along, but certainly one of the limitations that we've had to face in the field is that there aren't great models beyond actually using humans, <laughs> which we can do for some things, but not for others. So Jennifer, with that said, um, if we wanted, I mean, I know that this question comes up a lot, and if for somebody, if people that are not in the field, if they asked you so, in how long do you think we could potentially be looking at uh, being able to delay menopause or increase women's fertility? Um, how, I mean, do you think it's going to happen within our lifetime, 10 years, 20? Do you, are you seeing something that is really promising, which makes it even earlier? Because I, most people, the general public, they just want to know when they'll have access to these type of technologies. So can you give us an educated answer on this or is it too early to tell? Um, yeah, I can tell you what I think uh, as long as you take it with a grain of salt that this is just my opinion. But you know, from what I've seen, I think um, there's there's been a huge increase in research in this area and that gives me a lot of hope. And so I would say in the next five years or 10 years, um, breaking it down from short term to long term, obviously the moonshot goal is to you know, understand what the fundamental drivers of ovarian aging are and intervene to slow them down or stop them and, you know, put off menopause forever, like cancel menopause, essentially. Um, but, you know, until we get there, there's a lot of things that are happening that are really exciting and I think very, very promising. So um, I think we already 
know some of the targets, um, you know, things like uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, increased inflammation, changes in the microenvironment in the ovary. Um, these things, I think, are, um, are going to serve as a foundation for systematic drug development, screening, therapeutic interventions, and hopefully preclinical and clinical trials um, over the next few years. Um, but separately from that, there's, you know, there's, I would say, some pretty low-hanging fruit in terms of redefining diagnostics. You know, the tools that we use right now to try to discern where a woman is both in her reproductive cycle, but also in her reproductive span, you know, where she is along her individual trajectory towards menopause, they're really, really primitive, right? Um, blood tests that take a static snapshot of a dynamic fluctuating system, taking temperature. There's a lot of room for innovation around diagnostics. Um, and we funded quite a few grants uh, that are looking at biomarkers. Um, so, you know, trying to understand where a woman is in her reproductive um, span, you know, defining a clock essentially that will give us um, the ability to, to tell a woman where she is in her own independent uh, trajectory. And then, you know, um, I would say there's a lot of promising cellular targets on the horizon too. Um, and I, you know, thinking about what people can do, sort of in the moment, you know, women who might be approaching menopause or having just gone through it, um, there's a lot of things that we know from from previous research that ovarian aging can be accelerated by, like genetics, um, obesity, lots of environmental factors, um, medically induced agents like chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, those are all things that affect ovarian aging. So you know, it's, I would say it's a reproductive function in a woman is, is such a multivariable signature, right? It's complicated, but that doesn't mean that we can't, you know, it, we're, we're not completely, <laughs> we're not completely ignorant, ignorant at this point. So there's, there are some things that are coming down the pipeline that I think are pretty promising. Yeah, I can uh, speak of one which I'm very excited about. And Nina Lauk, who's in the audience, she uh, she's developing something for this. And I'm excited because it's diagnostics for menopause. Um, I think, you know, I speak to a lot of women in their in midlife and um, they feel so in the dark, even though we're in the year 2021. And technically we are um, we have so much so much amazing technology, but they can't tell one thing from the other when it comes to this uh, uh, this actual process in life. So this will be very exciting um, in the next few years. I have a question from somebody in the audience who can come up. So we're going to start our question part, and then I'll let everybody else um, go. I also brought Ada, who works with Nathan. And they have this amazing uh, program and on deck uh, uh, longevity and biotech and I I brought her up because I joke with Nathan that I hoped a lot of companies would be doing a, a lot of their cohort hopefully will get inspired to do companies um, in the in this space but the first question is from Jill Brown who's in the audience and she asked uh, Janet Jackson another um, I guess celebrities got pregnant after 50. What are your thoughts on how common this will become? And is it quote unquote healthy? Um, so that's a really interesting question. And um, I have to say that um, the longer that I've been working in this space, the more I hear these stories um, and women will talk about their uh, miracle babies, right? Uh, or this sort of thing that happened that Everyone had told them that they were infertile, um, and then, you know, they went through fertility treatments, nothing worked, and then one day, you know, boom, just naturally pregnant, and maybe past the time when they thought they were even fertile, right? And um, I have to say that I don't think these are miracles. I think that um, at the level of an individual, and this is another question, um, Avi, that is so fundamental to answer, and I think if we could figure it out, we really would would, would have a handle on what's going on. And that is, why is it so variable at the level of the individual, right? The, the average age of menopause, it spans something like 14 years, right? If you're uh, younger than 40, then you're considered going through early menopause. And if you're older than 54, um, then you're considered going through menopause late. But in between those numbers, that's considered quote unquote normal, which is so bizarre and just so, it's a, such a huge range. 
And so, you know, a woman's fertility is cyclical, but it's also stochastic at the level of an individual. And so older women go through periods of hyperfertility. Young women can go through periods of infertility, even when they're very healthy. And um, I think one of the reasons why it's so important for us to, to get better diagnostics and to get better biomarkers for understanding um, what's happening is that, you know, small things, a woman's reproductive health is linked to her overall health, right? If you think about um, even young women, right? If there's, if there's an underlying dysfunction in reproductive organs, um, it can profoundly affect other parts of the body and versa, right? So women with PCOS are more prone to metabolic diseases later in life. Um, but changing, you know, changing those environmental factors, changing the environment in which um, the follicle or the egg is developing can have really profound effects on fertility. So changing diet, changing sleep, you know, everyone wants a, a magic bullet, but the truth is that a lot of the sort of um, more, uh, <laughs> more basic interventions like, you know, that, that we think about actually, you know, lifestyle choices can change fertility. So um, sorry, that was a long winded answer, but yeah. And, and I love the idea, um, Nicolina, of uh, glycan age. I think that that's also a really promising technology for telling women where they are in terms of um, their reproductive span. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I, I don't think that was a long-winded answer at all. That was uh, super interesting. And I have, again, like 900 questions about this um, and other things. But I will let uh, the audience members who have been waiting uh, you know, to ask these questions and others, um, uh, Ada, uh, if you would like to uh, come up and ask uh, your question. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer, Laura, and Avi for this panel. It was super informative and inspiring. And um, like Laura say, hopefully the fellows at On Deck Longevity will work on this problem more. Um, so my question is about the brain. So Jennifer, um, coming from like a neuroscience perspective, um, as a researcher, what are some interaction do you see between like the brain and ovarian aging and what are some research directions are you looking at in this area if any yeah sure i didn't talk about my own research at all <laughs> i'm a neuroscientist by training and so what what i'm trying to understand is how the conversation between the brain and reproductive organs changes with age so i i think that um you know the brain essentially controls all aspects of female reproduction uh, it includes yeah, development, puberty, menstruation, fertility, conception, pregnancy, childbirth, lactation, even child care. Um, those are all controlled by neurons in the brain. And um, it's not a, you know, the brain is not a ruling like a dictator. It, it's like actually constantly listening to and integrating feedback from those organs. So there's this dynamic ongoing chemical conversation between the brain and the reproductive organs that determines what happens in the system. And that language um, of neuronal communication is mediated by chemicals that some of which we know about, like um, steroid hormones, you know, progesterone, uh, progesterone estrogen, testosterone, others, um, some neuropeptides that we know about like GnRH and kisspeptin. But in general, we don't know, uh, we don't know the, the entire lexicon uh, of these chemicals. And we don't know how they change with age. And so I think that um, because the brain, you know, there are circuits in the brain that are coordinating um, the monthly cycle. And, you know, when the ovary stops functioning at menopause, the reason that all of those negative health things happen is because the hormones and, and chemicals that the ovary was producing are no longer there. And so that communication between the brain and the ovary stops. And that, that leads to just a uh, so many detrimental um, aspects of, of menopause that I think the, the brain is, is a key a key player here. And of course I'm biased, so everyone should, should take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. But you know, if you think about the part of the brain where those reproductive neural circuits reside, right? That's also where um, the pathways that control other homeostatic systems like circadian rhythms, fluid um, energy balance, body temperature regulation, those circuits are all in the same place physically in the brain where the circuits that control reproductive function are, are located. And so, and those neurons are so cool because they're not just controlling the physiology, 
but they're also controlling the associated behaviors, right? So for example, circadian circuits control um, sleep, uh, energy homeostasis circuits control eating, um, and so on and so forth. And so when you think about the constellation of like physical and emotional symptoms that are associated with menstruation and motherhood and menopause, they're suddenly brought into this really sharp focus when you when you view it through the lens of the brain, right? Suddenly it's, all of these things are making sense. And so understanding how those circuits um, change with age and and how you know how the way that they communicate those chemicals, how that changes with age, um, I think that's going to be key to understanding how to intervene. So, yeah. Thank you, Ada, for that amazing question. Um, and yes, hopefully you'll get lots of the fellows looking to this field. Um, Aaron, welcome to the stage. Thank you for being here. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. I know you've been waiting for a while. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was, I'm, I'm just really glad that um, somebody from your, your domain at Buck Institute is here because I was going to try to contact you guys at some point um, in the future. Um, hopefully I can just send you my email through this, uh, back channel thing in clubhouse, but so I'm, I came up with a fundamental theory of aging, which is kind of centered around the oocytes, um, or the, the gametes in general, like the schism between the germline and the soma. Um, I'm pretty sure that's where <laughs> everything kind of, uh, the nexus of activity is at. um, as for a question. Uh, do you guys, there's been a recent discovery in the past decade or so about oocyte stem cells. So the concept that um, you're born with all the eggs you'll ever have is debatable at this point. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so there's, a, I would say this is a, this is a very controversial area. And I think, um, I think that I guess I don't want to wade too far into it um, beyond saying that, that there's a disagreement there. But I think that the evidence for human uh, oocyte stem cells is not there. I haven't seen any compelling evidence for that in humans. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I can talk more about this offline, but I think that there's a series of testable hypotheses, which if, if there were oocyte stem cells, then you would expect you know certain results, and and that just hasn't been borne out by by the data. And um, and a lot of those studies, I'm told, I have not personally tried to reproduce them, but I'm told that some of them have not. People have not been able to reproduce those those really exciting initial findings that there might be stem cells left. Um, certainly, in some animals, there are you know lots of animals produce eggs all the way through their lives, um, and so you know it's not outside the realm of biological possibility that it could be, you know, possible. And maybe, you know, we don't know, we don't know how, we don't know what the causal factor is for triggering reproductive senescence. And so, um, and we don't know where that happens along the developmental trajectory. We don't know if it's something that happens, you know, before birth or during early development or during puberty or young adulthood or midlife. We just don't know when that, that trigger is or what it is. And so, um, you know, we actually, as a result, we don't know what is going to be the right kind of therapy that will, that will ultimately extend reproductive span and fertility and push off menopause. But a really easy, you know, and um, straightforward way to do that might be to just either increase the number of eggs that a woman starts with or slow down the rate at which she loses eggs, right? Um, and so you could think about lots of different ways to intervene in those in, in those two scenarios. Um, and if oocyte stem cells either exist or or we could you know somehow make them <laughs> happen again, you know that's one possibility. But yeah, so um, yeah, I, I I it's definitely a, a controversial area whether or not they they exist in humans. Um, but I haven't seen I haven't seen great evidence for that. Okay. Um, I have another question. I'll, um, I'll Aaron, wait till later. I'm so sorry. We're going to have to go to the next question because, no, that's what I, um, I'll wait you know, I mean, I'll, I'll um, honestly suggest uh, sending an email and continuing the conversation. I'm glad that you um, are. I mean, it, it is obviously a lengthy conversation that you could have on this. 
But um, thank you for being here again and for your question. Uh, Tyler, if, if we have time, Aaron, we, you can ask your question, your next question, actually. So, Tyler, welcome to the stage. Please go ahead and ask a question. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, um, I remember reading a study that they said that a plant-based diet um, delayed menopause. And I just wanted to get your thoughts and, and the correlation between the plant-based diet and menopause in general. Sure. Um, so uh, plants have uh, compounds called phytoestrogens, which are estrogen-like um, molecules, you know, steroid hormones of which estrogen is one. They all have the same sort of um, chemical framework and they just differ at a couple of different positions, but they sort of have the same core structure. And so phytoestrogens um, can very weakly act on the same receptors that estrogen does. And um, so there, there is some evidence in the literature that eating, um, you know, that consuming phytoestrogens can help to stave off some of the symptoms of menopause. Um, whether that, you know, I don't think I've seen any really, uh, I don't know that there are any really comprehensive or compelling studies that would actually look at um, delaying ovarian aging using using these uh, using like a plant-based diet, but certainly some of the symptoms, right, the, the vasomotor symptoms of menopause can be alleviated uh, at least to some degree by by eating phytoestrogen. So I, I think um, the best uh, everything that we do at this point to sort of mitigate the effects of ovarian aging from IVF all the way through, you know, things like uh, supplements and, and plant-based diets, they're all band-aids, right? Um, and so that's a, I would say that's a sort of a weak band-aid. Um, the best band-aid for people who've already gone through menopause um, to try to alleviate those symptoms is, is hormone replacement therapy. So trying to put back some of those chemicals that, that disappear when the ovaries stop functioning. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Um, it's funny, Jennifer, because uh, a lot of women are always trying to find, um, I, you call their Band-Aid um, fixes, but I know that you hear a lot of women trying to figure out how to do these things without going through HRT. And I think we have to do more education on that because there is the the notion that people believe it's bad for you or you're going to get cancer. It got a bad rep. And um, when you speak about HRT, then they, they think badly of you. But that's another call or conversation altogether. I'm very uh, happy to have Dr. Catherine here who practices longevity medicine. Dr. Catherine, welcome to the stage. Uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be listening to this conversation because in my private practice, this is what I see. I trend and follow the biomarkers of menopause as we have them, and they're quite crude, right? We have FSH, AMH, estradiol, antral follicle count, inhibin B, and what I see in my patients is that when we do some of these lifestyle things that we know are related to uh, longevity a bit, if it's some calorie restriction, some fasting, addressing insulin resistance, supporting the hypothalamic axis, reducing inflammation, addressing uh, some of the inflammation in, a, in a, a woman, reducing stress, looking at those circadian insults. And I do see that we can lower FSH. I do see that we can raise estradiol levels. But I also think when we take the guidelines now from the North American Menopause Society and we destigmatize hormone replacement therapy and we appreciate that some women's brains do better in perimenopause with supporting estrogen replacement earlier and we don't neglect the probably 1% of women who are in premature ovarian failure and are not aware of these symptoms. Um, we have so much work to do here. So I'm just thrilled to hear that the work is being done and my question for you is this, with the SARS-CoV-2 pathogen, we are seeing and expecting that there will be an insult to reproductive uh, capacity in women. And how is this being studied and what signal are you seeing and how can we chain, change our you know, vaccination campaign to young women to really help them appreciate that this is a risk to their reproductive uh, health span? Oh yeah, that's um, there's a lot to unpack there, but let me address the the actual question you asked at the end um, 
about uh, COVID and SARS-CoV-2. So I think, so I have not seen, there's no question that there will probably be something um, something that we find that changes reproductive aging. Um, but of course that won't come out for, for several years probably because um, we have to actually look for it. But um, I think in some ways, uh, <laughs> the, the long tradition of using male bodies um, in biomedical research, you know, has kind of put us at a disadvantage um, when looking at COVID-19. But um, I, so I think, you know, changing, I'm not sure that we have any data yet that would allow us to put a message out there to young women to, to encourage them to get vaccinated, unfortunately. But um, that's a, an interesting thought. Uh, there's, you know, there are in real time, um, a lot of different centers at, at medical uh, medical centers that have set up um, research arms to study long COVID, right? Um, but there's, you know, I don't, I'm not aware of research that's happening around looking at ovarian aging as an endpoint um, for, for just, you know, just getting COVID, not necessarily having long COVID. That's a really interesting idea. Um, and now I'm going to start planting that seed. <laughs> Well, the you, you people know, I know. <laughs> right. I mean, I saw your research about, you know, anosmia, you know, being related to sex hormone signaling. And uh, we also know there's pretty significant ACE2 receptors in uh, yeah. the, the reproductive tract in women. So we, we have seen, you know, histologically that impact acutely for men, you know, change in sperm counts, change in testosterone production. We know the ovary is a far more sensitive tissue uh, and ages precipitously. Uh, so I would suspect just like the neuronal tissue and the clinical symptoms we see and those who are infected and the, you know, decent percentage of people who have these long effects, I am quite concerned and I do hope that we can put some research there. And certainly we're all in the observation unit as is. Um, thank you. Yeah. It's um, no, it's a really, it's a really good point um, and something to consider. I will say too, um, uh, Dr. Catherine, that um, one of the things we're trying to do is to work with clinicians to to increase the the awareness um, and also just the information that's available to clinicians around menopause. Right? Uh, NAMS does not do a great job, in my opinion, of. <laughs> of putting information out there that's accessible and usable by clinicians. And so a lot of the advice that's given around HRT is simply wrong, right? Um, like you said, uh, Laura, women, when they hear me recommend that they take HRT um, as a way to mitigate the symptoms of menopause, they, uh, they, they balk at that idea because there was this study, um, the WHI study, which um, was uh, picked up by the popular press, um, but has been debunked um, just over and over and over again. It's just not true. And it, when it comes down to HRT, you know, there's, there's, <laughs> unless you have a risk of, a uh, familiar risk of breast cancer, um, there's really no reason that the, the health risks that you incur by not having those hormones around are so much more drastic um, than anything that, that might happen in terms of uh, increased cancer risk. And so really it's a risk reward ratio that each individual woman needs to evaluate, you know, in consultation with a physician. But in general, the, the positive benefits of, of HRT are well documented in literature, you know, in tens of thousands of women. I did a whole webinar about this as well. And what I did on purpose was I went through the study. I, I went through, you know, what the data said. Um, and by the way, none of it was statistically significant, which is very important to note. Um, and then we went through all the studies that have happened since then. Um, and there have been, you know, dozens and dozens of papers published just taking apart why, um, why the, the, the message that the press transmitted was so wrong. But that information hasn't reached women for sure, and it definitely hasn't reached physicians um, who sometimes don't prescribe HRT when they should. Anyway, I could also talk about this for a long time, so um, we should probably go on to the next question. But Catherine, I'm probably going to reach out to you and, and try to... Um, Try to coordinate with you because we're trying to put together a you know a group of clinicians who will help us 
um, with a, a list of, of questions that women should be asking their doctors and conversely, a list of things that, that physicians should be doing for their patients um, at different ages, uh, just as a, a resource. Absolutely. I think that's fantastic. And, you know, to the credit of the North American Menopause Society, they they did release a position paper. They debunked pretty well the Women's Health Initiative study, made very clear that the benefit is in favor, and we probably should be looking more at the risks of women's uh, weight and alcohol consumption and how those are uh, putting them at a higher risk, actually, from a relative risk perspective than HRT and using, of course, the bioidentical. Um, so we, we have a lot of work to do, and um, it usually takes a couple decades before a paper is published to a change in clinical practice actually being manifest. So we have to do that work and amplify this messaging. But we do have a very receptive audience because women are feeling their age more and more, um, and we're, we're ready to talk about it, right, and, and do something about it. And I, I appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Thank you for that great question, Catherine. And um, Jennifer, it'll be great to have you back again and even uh, with Dr. Catherine and other uh, clinicians to talk about HRT. One of the things that I noticed here on Clubhouse is um, holistic approach to things has been co-opted to promote a lot of uh, snake oil. And when I say snake oil, I literally say oil because there are rooms where have hundreds of people promising you're going to be cured of everything with uh, these oils and something else. So it's literally oil. And uh, a lot of these rooms, women are talking about bioidentical uh, hormones. They don't want to have anything to do with HRT. And it's just very unfortunate that there is such a hesitancy to believe in science um, these days. And it also has to do with COVID. Um, so we have to do a lot in terms of communication. I will let Avi ask the last question before... Um, we end the session. Avi, please go ahead. Oh dear, that uh, I, I didn't know that was the last question. Uh, but again, uh, this has been this has been highly educational for me. Uh, I hope it has been for everybody else as well. Um, Catherine and Jennifer's discussion was absolutely fantastic, which led me on to this question. Um, Jennifer and and many other people in the panel are aware of uh, Greg Bay's. Um, thymus uh, trial, so thymus uh, rejuvenation trial, uh, which showcased actually in trying to rejuvenate um, or or at least recapitulate some of the thymus, they have been able to show epigenetic uh, uh, or decrease in epigenetic age, uh, which is correlated seemingly with biological age markers um, within about six to uh, six months to 12 months of treatment in humans. So my question is, again, Jennifer, uh, part basic science and then part application that you and Catherine were discussing, which is that um, uh, thymus involutes, and that is pretty well taught in textbooks. So what is the difference between the involution of an organ like thymus versus the degradation or the rapid degradation of an organ like um, uh, the ovaries. And the, I mean, it clearly has states uh, once you start puberty and, and when you stop uh, or, or start menopause. And so it has these state changes that, that happen, but in between there's this rapid accelerated aging. How does that, how does that differ from the involution of an organ like thymus? Um, and then finally, if, if our colleagues like Greg Fay can do clinical trials uh, with a mixture of um, compounds that are either already in the FDA's Orange Book, aka um, you know the available pharmaceuticals plus some supplements. Can we not think about doing similar things? Because uh, you guys were talking about HRT, which is after or during menopause. I'm talking about um, relatively healthy females, but who have older, accelerated aged organs. Uh, in this case, I'm talking about ovaries. So can you not think about doing clinical trials on, uh, I hate to say it, but you know, uh, what is considered by everybody else in the world healthy uh, female, but, but with an aged organ? Um, so yeah, that's, th those are the two parts. What is the difference between involution uh, and what happens in the ovaries? And can you do clinical trials or can you think about doing clinical trials in you know, a relatively healthy 30-year-old female? 
Yeah, um, I'll take the second part of that question first. So yes, what I what I'm that is exactly what I'm uh, advocating that we should um, think about ovarian aging. And of course, you know, we would need to define some really great markers um, uh, to do that. But to define ovarian aging as a as a great clinical model for um, longevity or health span increasing interventions. And so that would mean um, testing something that you assume will be a, a longevity intervention in a young woman um, and you know taking her through the two to five years, um, that period during which the ovaries undergo this dramatic decline, which would be you know early 30s for most women um, and, and having that be a clinical trial for, for longevity interventions. And it will be, I mean, it would be transformative, right? It would be so much shorter than any other um, any other intervention trials that are out there and in a human as opposed to in a model organism. So yes, emphatically, yes. Um, and for those on deck fellows who might be listening or if, um, uh, <laughs> anyone who wants to talk to me about this stuff, I'm happy, I'm happy to talk about these ideas. I mean, um, one of the next steps for the consortium is to think about um, is to think about uh, an accelerator for companies in this space. Um, in terms of thymus um, involution, this is definitely not my area of expertise. So, um, just a disclaimer there. But you know, I think about um, you know if if ovaries are the first organs to age, then the thymus is probably the second. Um, and I think. Uh, Thymic involution happens, I believe, across all vertebrates. Um, I might be wrong about that, but I think it happens really um, in almost every vertebrate that we know about. And so unlike menopause, there might be a really good reason for it. <laughs> um, uh, that's what that would lead me to believe. But you know, the, the, the decline, basically um, inflammation or this change in, in the immune system and the overall increase in inflammation that occurs with age. This is, um, this is true in ovaries as well, that ovarian inflammation definitely is a hallmark of ovarian aging. And so, you know, the thymus is, is a point of regulation for the immune system. And so um, intervening there is, is obviously, you know, has really beneficial effects on aging. Um, but I think that, you know, the difference is that the thymus still continues to function, right? Although it's it's much reduced, it's not completely um, it's not completely ceasing to function. Whereas ovarian ovarian aging, you know, when ovaries stop functioning, they really do turn off um, pretty much completely. They don't uh, they no longer signal. Um, it's that release of oocytes, that follicle development every month that that we think about as as the hallmark of ovarian function, and it doesn't just decline; it stops completely at menopause. So it's a like a cliff, you know. It's a, <laughs> it's a, a binary switch in a way. Um, whereas I I think of thymic involution as you know as being a dramatic thing that happens, but that the thymus uh, still continues to function at some level. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but that those are my thoughts, <laughs> my very uninformed thoughts. Uh, just off the top of my head. You know, I do think we hear that a lot, that it is like a cliff. But when we really look at, you know, that perimenopausal window, which can be so variable, um, there are very erratic changes in, in how estrogen is released in the, the fluctuations of FSH and how in the luteal phase inhibin it can suppress or potentiate FSH. And the body is really trying to do the best it can to, I think, stay younger. And in different women, depending on these epigenetic factors, that signal um, can, can be, you, you can pull on those levers a little bit. But we do see very um, erratic changes. So I do think, and that's why I think perimenopause can be so difficult for women. They can go from like flashing to flooding, you know, and that's what estrogen will do. It will go from quite high to, to very, very low. And um, there's a lot of volatility there. So I think that tells us there's opportunity as well. But of course, it is more like a cliff when we compare it to men and their testosterone levels and their andropause, if that is a thing. Yeah, absolutely. Perimenopause is, um, is a, yeah, but, but that's an area where um, 
yes, it's very, extremely variable. But but once a woman is fully through menopause, you know, the ovaries have completely ceased functioning. There's not there's not anything else happening there. Oh, agreed, agreed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but they they don't go out without a fight. So it's like no, they don't fireworks. go out without a fight. There's yeah. a grand you think it's a grand finale, <laughs> and then it's not, and then you keep waiting, and then and it's over, and everyone packs. Yeah, but not, but thymus, I think of the thymus continues to kind of lurch along at some low level, doesn't it? Am I misremembering that? I don't know as much about it. Um, maybe, Abby? Abby, you could enlighten us. No, no, no. I did my uh, PhD in skin cells, so like uh, that oh, was okay. far away from, from thymus. So, no. Um, what I learned from Greg uh, uh, that uh, I don't think that is the case. Uh, and what I learned from, uh, interestingly, my sister works in the IVF space and she's a surgeon. Uh, uh, she uh, and, and other people here may already know surgeons or are surgeons themselves. Catherine, I actually, I don't know uh, if you are just a general practitioner or also a surgeon as well. But uh, yeah, it's very difficult to even find the organ in a 40 year old human. Uh, you you would need specialized skills. Um, so I don't think it it lurches on for very long, if past very much past the thirties and things like that. But yeah, no. Um, again, I am not uh, a specialist on this, and I, I love I love how you speculate, uh, Jennifer. But you you like you add interesting points, but you never take it uh, beyond uh, you know what what we understand mm -hmm. and how how you extend these thoughts. Um, this is pretty. Uh, I love this discussion. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, thank you so much. We have a couple. Of, I don't know how you're for time because we did tell you um, one hour or like just an hour and 15 oh, minutes. I'm fine. But... I'm fine for now. Sure. OK, so uh, we have a couple more questions. Do you mind? And I have one last question as well. But um, we have Girish who wanted to. He said it is a bit of a technical question and I know it's going to be a great one. And then uh, we have actually one of the. Uh, and actually an on deck fellow, but not for the, yeah, actually he is in the longevity biotech. So that's great. Uh, I'll bring you both up. Girish, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Laura. Sorry. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> I have my two year old in the, in the back seat. So I was waiting for the most opportunistic time to kind of tune in, um, uh, and ask this question, but, um, Jennifer, my question for you is there's been some interesting results uh, in terms of therapeutic plasma exchange and how that uh, extends the, uh, you know, how that extends reproductive um, health span. Uh, and this has been shown in both mouse studies and some, you know, early clinical data run by Dobri Kiprof. Um, and a lot of it is revolving around this idea. You talked about this crosstalk between uh, the ovaries, the somatic gonad, and uh, the brain and other, um, other factors in the blood, uh, primarily progeronic factors, these factors that accelerate uh, aging across several tissues. And, you know, Tony Whiskeré has defined this plasma proteome where there's these three peaks, uh, apparently, in, these, uh, in the plasma proteome in which uh, at the ages, I believe, 30 and 60 and uh, 80 years old, um, uh, these proteins accelerate aging uh, across the body. So I'm wondering if uh, you've looked into any of the, you know, uh, system-wide factors that may be released that are uh, driving aging within the ovaries, uh, as it might not be a completely like intrinsic or cell autonomous process. Thanks so much. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. And that wasn't a plant. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think, um, yeah, there's a lot of really beautiful research in this space. And um, and it, it grew, I think it grew out of this idea that, um, that there might be like a fountain of youth factor, but in the end, what, what came out of this research was that just what you said, that um, there are progeronic factors. So there's, you know, there are things that seem to drive aging or accelerate aging, um, much more so than having some magic bullet pill that would be like the fountain of youth. It's kind of the opposite. You sort of need to get rid of the bad stuff um, as, as opposed to introducing some, some magical um, pill thing. Um, and Tony's work, uh, he's at Stanford, is, is really beautiful. Um, the short answer is yes, that, that's a part of the basis for my research program is to look for those um, circulating factors that might, um, that might mediate ovarian aging, whether accelerating it or slowing it down. And one of the places that, that we look in my lab is at a, not the proteome, 
um, because I think that that's been really beautifully characterized by a lot of different groups. Um, but at the peptidome, uh, which is related but but not the same, um, and you know the methods that we use to look at proteomics, so just to look at the proteins that are in a sample. Um, are very different from the methods that we would use to look for um, bioactive peptides, and that's that's what we focus on. And so, um, but it's a little bit confusing because proteins are just chains of amino acids, um, and when you cut them up, um, small chains of amino acids are called peptides. And so, when I say bioactive peptides, and when I say proteins, most people think that means the same thing, but um, they're actually chemically really distinct. And um, and when you're doing a proteomics experiment, when you're doing a workflow to isolate proteins and characterize them, um, the first thing you do is you get rid of anything that might be a bioactive peptide. <laughs> uh, and conversely, when you're working up to characterize uh, bioactive peptides, the first thing you do is get rid of all the proteins. And so there's just been not a lot of work done in this space. Um, it's a difficult landscape to, to measure. And, um, and so there's not very many groups that do this. And, that's one of the places we're looking for these um, these circulating factors that might mediate communication between the brain and the ovaries um, and potentially uh, change either accelerate or slow down uh, aging. So yeah, we're actively working on that. Uh, Girish, thank, thank so you for your question. And. Um... Jennifer, since I think Miguel cannot come on stage anymore, I guess um, I'm going to make my last question a two-part question. One, the first part is, um, what? As a, I mean, you're you're a neuroscientist. How did you get into looking into the longevity the longevity of female fertility? And secondly, as women, how what can we do to promote your work and um, the work that a lot of amazing researchers and scientists are doing? Um, those are awesome questions. So yeah, I started as a, I'm a neuroscientist by training, although my PhD was in chemistry um, and chemical biology. So I spent a lot of time thinking about bioactive peptides and natural products and um, drugs as a PhD student. And then I moved into neuroscience for my postdoc and uh, I was just fascinated by bioactive peptides. And I started working on a class of signaling molecules called neuropeptides. Um, and when I started my own lab at the Buck Institute, um, I had this idea uh, because I was working on oxytocin signaling, which is one of these neuropeptides. There are hundreds of them. Um, and as I was looking into oxytocin and its effect on aging, um, we, when we dove into the mechanism, uh, we actually, that led us to reproductive aging. And that was right around the time when um, uh, when we had uh, Nicole Shanahan approached us and asked us whether we would start a center to study female reproductive aging. She was really prescient in understanding that this is an important problem that really needed more basic science um, to move the field forward. And so it was just like a natural progression of things. Um, and, uh, and here we are. <laughs> uh, now most of my research program is focused on this question. Um, in terms of helping out, if there's something you, you know, one, one thing that everyone who's listening can do is to spread the word. So we really do need non-science ambassadors to amplify the message of what we're doing. I think that, um, you know, this should be something that every single person on the planet is interested in. You know, there's an economic aspect to menopause that we haven't discussed at all, but um, it's a huge, huge economic burden. And as more and more people um, are going through menopause, by 2025, it's estimated that something like 1 billion women will be in menopause, which is going to be something like 12% of the world's population. Um, we can't afford to ignore this anymore. And um, and so just spreading the word about what we're doing is, is would be amazing. So we have... Um, we have a white paper that we wrote about this, which is written for non-scientists, um, it, and it's available on um, uh, on our website, which is linked in my profile. Um, which, uh, it's buckinstitute.org/gcrle. Um, beyond that, you know, I'm constantly trying to find uh, funders to to fund the consortium. Um, Nicole and the Biaco Foundation are the seed funders in the space, and they've done an amazing job. 
um, and we're really grateful for their support, but we want to make this bigger, right? We want to give away more grants. We want to encourage more creative scientists to work in the space. Um, we want to fund um, this accelerator, you know, to house early stage companies in the space. We have a lot of ideas <laughs> um, and, you know, as much as possible, we, we intend to be giving away these grants every single year. Um, and beyond that, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you know anyone who's interested in the space, send them our way. I have these conversations every day and building out the next um, to, you know, build a healthy ecosystem around this research area is essentially, you know, that's why we exist. So, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, those are the, the main things that you could do if you wanted to help. Um, those are amazing things. I love the non-science ambassador. Count me in for that. Um, Nina jokes around that I'm like longevity's uh, biggest cheerleader. Uh, I find it funny, but um, I, it is very important that the general public or people that are not in the field do understand the, the amazing potential of all of this uh, research and um, technology and um, all the work that the scientists are doing. And with that said, I'm very appreciative of today of Avi, who stayed up, and also Nina there in Europe. Anybody who stayed up in Europe uh, listening to this, really appreciate Thank you, Avi, for moderating this with me and uh, staying up and missing on your longevity sleep. I'm going to let you say um, some words, and then um, Jennifer and everybody else, thank you. I mean, I'll let you speak as well, and then we're going to end the session. Avi, please go ahead. Oh, why are we stopping now? We could just... Uh, Jennifer, Catherine, everybody, uh, Aaron, Ada, uh, everybody here is just super awesome. Jennifer, thank you for coming. Thank you for, uh, you know, giving us uh, uh, this insight into, um, you know, female reproductive longevity and um, how ovaries work um, and a little bit about thymus as well. I mean, this is absolutely fascinating. I can't wait to get this collaboration started. Um, I'll, I'll get in touch with you and see if we can actually collaborate with something in Oxford and also the outside of United States uh, funding network that does exist, by the way, guys. Uh, so Europe and UK does have some capital that uh, they like to invest in, in uh, biotech. So um, yeah, I would, I would, I mean, this, this seems like an absolutely uh, fascinating project and uh, I would definitely like this to be uh, towards clinical trial and, and, uh, uh, and test on longevity. So thank you uh, for being here. This was an absolute pleasure to be on this panel. Um, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Jennifer, again. Thank you, Avi. Thank you, Laura. I really appreciate um, the, the opportunity to talk. And I also appreciate all of the uh, really great questions from everybody in the audience. So um, please feel free to, to reach out. Um, Avi, I'll, I'll contact you offline. Um, and thank you, Laura, for organizing this whole series. Yes, thank you, Jennifer. Um, um, we're going to be talking for the uh, the rest of the season uh, we about women's longevity. So hopefully you can come back in other um, calls. And um, any everybody else, thank you again for being here and spending this time with us. Uh, we're back next Wednesday at 2 p.m. with uh, Nicolina Lauk, actually from Glycan Age, and, sp and speak about... Uh, testing um, biomarkers for aging. So thank you again, Jennifer, everybody else, and uh, have a great evening. And uh, hopefully with this kind of conversations will get more people interested in studying the longevity of female fertility. Have a great evening and remember to join the club and uh, hopefully see you in other sessions. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>